If you have your Bibles with you, would you open them up to Psalm chapter 51 with me? As many of you know, my wife and I, we lived in New Orleans. During the time of Hurricane Katrina, we found ourselves displaced. Hurricane Katrina hit on a Monday. All week long, my wife and I sat in front of a TV, looked on the internet, trying to determine if we had lost everything or not. By the time Sunday came around, we had come to the conclusion that we had probably lost everything that we had in New Orleans. We had come to the realization that we probably weren't going back to New Orleans. Within a week, everything in our lives had changed. And as Christians, whenever your life gets rocked and your life gets shattered, you want to go to a safe place. And so the place we chose to go to was church because it was Sunday. After a week of struggling, we went and we sat in the sermon as we listened to the preacher preach and, and afterwards went down because the preacher wanted to say a, two, a few words to me because we were in New Orleans and the, the preacher wanted to ask me a theological question. And the theological question he wanted to ask me was this. He said, do you believe that New Orleans was flooded and Hurricane Katrina hit because of all the gay people living in New Orleans? One, I just lost everything, and the words of compassion that he has to give me are words of anger. Two, he's talking about my neighbors. Three, I'm not a gay person, I'm the one that's standing here because I don't have anything. And as a church, whenever it comes to the areas of homosexuality, whenever it comes to addressing... This issue as a church, I believe we have failed. And I believe we have failed on multiple different fronts. I know I have been guilty in many ways in my response to homosexuality. I know I have been guilty many times of making fun of, of sharing jokes with people I later found out. Would come out and say that they were gay and I did not act in any way around them that would be considered Christ like or loving. As a church, we have decided to take a stand, an aggressive stand against homosexuality instead of a stand of love. And I believe for my generation, this issue of homosexuality and how the church responds to it will be what most people remember from my generation of church. When they look back at the history books, this will will, will be what they they look at. And will be the controversy that comes up. And at this point in time, I don't know if the church is in any way winning. And this morning, what I want to look at, and what my goal is, is to be able to help us see what a positive response to homosexuality could be in the church. We're going to start in Psalm chapter 51. I'm going to read the whole Psalm 51 and then we're going to come back and we're going to look at parts of it. And then we're also going to spend some time again in Romans uh, chapter 1 this morning. But Psalm 51 starting in verse 1 says, Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Notice this in verse 5. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely you desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of your salvation to me and give me a willing spirit. Then I will 
Teach the rebellious your ways and sinners will return to you. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, for the God of my salvation and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and humble heart. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper, build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your idol. Psalm 51 was written by David. Many theologians and biblical scholars believe that this was written in response to prophet Nathan who had come to David after he'd sinned against Bathsheba. King David was known then and is remembered now by Israel and by the Christian community as being the greatest king that Israel ever had up until Jesus. And that was through David's line that Jesus would eventually come. But David had an extreme sexual sin with Bathsheba. Not only did he have a sexual sin with this, this woman in which was part of his kingdom and that he lured her in so that way he could have sexual relations with her. But in the process of trying to cover it up, he had Bathsheba's husband killed in battle. And this prophet named Nathan came to David and made his sin known to him. And here is David after being confronted about sexual sin. And here is his response. And David's response is one of humbleness. It's one of contrition. But I want to point out a couple of things that we see in here about this response. And one of them in particular is in verse 5. Where he talks about, indeed I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. And what David is saying here is says, from as far back as I can remember... I have been a sinner. From as far back as I can remember, I have had sinful tendencies. From the very moment that my mother conceived me, I was born into a broken world. Not only was I born into a broken world, but I was born into a broken world, broken. And from the time my mother conceived me until now, I am a sinner. And he admits to God, he said, God... I am unworthy of you. The the judgment that you choose to pass against me will be good, but show mercy to me. I know there's nothing I can do to be righteous in your eyes. All I can do is be broken. All I can do is be humbled. And it's whenever I come to you humbled and broken that again I can worship you. One of the things I hear from the LGBT community, the the, the homosexual community is what they, one of their frustrations in the terminology that we as a church use is we often use the term of choice. You have chosen this. You have chosen to be a sinner. You have, you have chosen homosexuality. And much of what I'm going to preach on today are things that have come to me from experiences with many different friends, with people that I'm very close to in my life, with people that I love. These are going to come to you from questions I've asked of scriptures, of time that I've spent in prayer from reading numerous books and numerous different sources. And I'll be honest with you today, I'm really nervous because we film and we and we record these, and the conversation and the best way to approach homosexuality from a church is something that's still developing within me. And I'm a little nervous about what may come out 10, 15 years from now whenever I become wiser and might stick with me. But even if, you were, if you're on Facebook and you see my, my pace, Facebook postings, you can see that there's even a conversation happening right now on my Facebook page about homosexuality. Um, in which I have, a, I have a friend who is a, a leader in the LGBT community who is having conversations with other people on my Facebook page about the issue. And one of the frustrations that he has, that he's bringing up on there, is this area of choice. 
And one thing that I've learned as I've been a pastor, as I have worked with people, is every single person I have worked with, every person I have counseled with, every person that's in my church is a sinner. And every single member that's a member of Sunrise Church has a sinful tendency. There's a sinful tendency that they continue to struggle with. And one of the worst things I have found with people that have a sinful tendency, regardless of what it is, is for me to say to them, just get over it. Just make a different choice. You need to choose something different. And and the thing I've noticed over and over again, it's not that easy. And for many people, they may have a sinful tendency, but to tell them, make a different choice, choose something different, isn't fair because they would love to. And whenever we talk with people that have call themselves homosexuals that are in that community, for many of them, I believe that this is a sinful temptation that they have, a sinful desires that they have that are from childhood, that are from their birth. I believe many times they're born with it. Just like with David, he was born with the sinful tendencies. I'm your pastor. There are sinful tendencies I've had in my life that I did not choose to have. I do not want them there. And in fact, I wish that they would go away. Because of the difficulties that they cause me in my life. And the problems that they cause for me. The problems that they cause for my family. And I believe sometimes even for the church body. And many of you, whenever you start talking about this. That you would think to yourself that even as I'm talking about this. You're thinking of sins that continually reoccur in your life. That you wish weren't there. That you wish would just disappear. And if you could choose something else. You would choose something else. And for many people I've talked to that have desires for, for people of the same sex, almost in every situation, in fact, my friend says this on the Facebook account, he goes, I wish I could choose something else. But he's not able to. Because this is the sinful tendency that he was born with. Now, while Jesus, I do not believe, was a sinner, I believe that even Jesus had sinful tendencies and temptations that he struggled with all of his life. For Jesus, I believe his primary sinful tendency was one, that he wanted to find a different way to bring God's creation back to God without the cross. We see Jesus, whenever he was in the desert for 40 days fasting, Satan takes him up on to the the temple mound and shows him everything. And he says, if you will bow down to me, then I will give you all of this. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to go through the cross. I will give you it all if you'll just bow down to me. Satan did that because that's something that Jesus, a part of Jesus, wanted to do. Even Jesus, on the night that he was arrested, sat down with the cup in front of him. We talked about this. And he said, God, if there's any other way, take this cup away from me. I don't want to go through this. It is your will that I go through this, but I don't want to go through this. The difference between Jesus and us is we oftentimes will give in to our sinful tendencies. Jesus did not. And one of the big questions that I hear is, can't you just choose something else? And I've known many people who are consider themselves homosexuals. And I've known many people who have done many, many things to try to take away their desires. For some of them, who are Christians, their choice has been, I will live a celibate life because I do not have a desire for people of the opposite sex. And so for me, I will live a celibate life. For others, they have gotten married and this has been an ongoing struggle for them and their families. And not to say one's right and one's sin and one's wrong. But just like for you and me, the sin is not our desire. To be born with a sinful desire does not necessarily make us sinful, does not necessarily make us sinners. Rather, what makes us sinners is whenever we act upon those desires that are contrary to God's will. But just like here, and with David, David had significant sexual sin in his life that not only was sexual sin but also led to murder. 
And for David, he was able to experience forgiveness. And he was able to be renewed with the cleansing from God that he was able to worship again. And I believe it's the same thing for people that have homosexual tendencies. And just like any of us who have a sinful tendency, chances are that we are going to slip Oftentimes, before we come to Christ, and even after we come to Christ, we're probably not done making mistakes. And we're probably going to struggle some more. But the thing that's unique about homosexuality versus other sinful tendencies and other struggles is that with homosexuality, the the church has taken a very negative stand. And we oftentimes have not taken a stand of love, of mercy, of empathy, of caring. Instead, our response oftentimes has come across as judgmental in the way that we've responded. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans uh, chapter 1. As we're going, let me ask you, are you guys kind of warm in here? I'm seeing some people fanning. Ken, can you turn the, the AC I, I turned it on, but I may not have set it low enough for it to kick on yet. Can you go ahead and do that? I see you guys are fanning yourself. In here, we're trying to set, set an ap- atmosphere of, heel, of hell, which is going to get really good as we get to the invitation time. You know, we ask everybody to repent. We're going to switch on the ACs. It's going to be a really powerful moving time. So just, I'm, that was really bad. I'm sorry. Okay. I will not tell any more jokes for the rest of the morning, I promise. But, but, but Romans... Chapter 1, and we looked at this passage of scripture a couple of weeks ago, whenever we looked at uh, creation, or God and science, you know, and can the, the two mix, can Christianity and science mix? And we looked at God as he was the creator, and that God created the world, because as we see the creation, as we see what God has created, it will lead us back to a point of wanting to worship but Romans continues on. It talks about those people that will see the realities of that there is a creator who created the world, but those people who choose not to worship him. And, and that's what we're going to be looking at here starting in Romans chapter 1, verse 24. It says, Therefore God delivered them over to their cravings, to the cravings of their hearts, to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served something created instead of the Creator who praised, who is praised forever. Amen. This is why God delivered them over to degrading passions. For even their females exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The males in the same way also left natural relations with females and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Males committed shameless acts with males and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. And because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to worthless mind to do what is moral, morally wrong. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanders, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Although they know full well God's just sentence that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but even applaud others who practice them. One of the struggles with homosexuality is not only is this a personal sin, but there has been a whole community that has developed out of it. And it's one of the few sins that we see that our society has wanted to label as okay. Not only okay, but as acceptable. And and in some ways applaud it as, as them being... 
what's, what's the word I want to, want to use here? With them, with them being more free, with them being able to, to, to live a, a more unburdened life than, than, than many. And the struggle has come is that this push has come upon the church and, and where the, a lot of the tension lies is that especially today it's becoming a civil rights issue that we're starting to see and experience to where, where people that are homosexual, they, they are beginning to receive rights underneath civil rights and that they are starting to gain rights in the school system and different things. Not only are they gaining rights, but they're also here in California, um, there have been bills passed in which um, homosexuality and the, the different leaders of the homosexual movement are going to start being taught in our high schools. Um, if I understand it with the angle that they are heroes of a particular civil rights movement. Not only that, but there's also that the church has been told that we need to be accepting of, of people within the homosexual community. Not only accepting, but we need to act as if this is not a sin and that this is okay. One of the big struggles I have is that as, as a church, we have made a decision a couple of years ago that within our bylaws, we have actually have a statement in there about um, same-sex marriage. And I'll be honest with you. I am... I'm supportive of it, and I recommended it, but I am very uncomfortable with it. Because it's the only thing in our Constitution and bylaws where we single out one group of people, or one sin, and we say, here's going to be our church's response to people like this. But yet, the struggle is that I feel as if we have to, is because... There are some, I don't even believe it's most, I believe it's few within the, the homosexual community that have been so hurt by the church that as they gain rights, they have a desire to want to come and they have a desire they're going to want to hurt the church. And hear me say this, I do not believe this is the majority, I believe that this is few, but we have seen some plans and some strategies that are out there that there's some people that would want to bring up issues against the church saying that we will not marry people who want a same-sex marriage. And because of that, they, they would want to challenge our tax-exempt status and some of the other statuses that we have as a church and, and, and want to create difficulties for us. Now let me say, that. I'm uncomfortable that it's in there, but I feel like it's necessary but as we read passages like this and as the community, as the world around us is wanting to say it's not a sin, this passage of scripture in Romans chapter 1 clearly communicates not only homosexuality but all sexual impurity, all sexual immorality is a sin. And as a church... Anybody who is living a life which is not filled with sexual purity is something that we teach against. Now, now here's a difference in the way we respond to it. And I think sometimes the church has misunderstood our role in this. Is that God, Jesus, whenever he left to go to heaven to prepare for us, he did not tell the church and did not tell Christians, as I leave, I am going to leave you here that you can be a judge. He did not say to the church, I am going to leave you here that you can condemn those who sin against me. Rather, our responsibility is that we left us here so that way we can baptize those, make converts, and then we can disciple them in order to help them be like Christ. And as a church and as Christians... I think sometimes we've misunderstood our role and that we feel like what God wants us to do is to point out to sinners that they are sinners. And sometimes that might be necessary, but our primary responsibility as a church is to make Christians. And you know, I, I come from the stance that one does not have to be sin-free in order to come to Christ. Because if that was true, none of us would. But too often we want to make the sinner pure, and then we want to introduce them to Jesus. 
But the truth is we introduce people to Jesus and then through the discipleship process we allow the Holy Spirit, notice back in Psalm 51, he's asking that God would create a new spirit within him, that God would do a work within him. Not us yelling at them to make a different choice. But now it changes and the language changes and there's a difference for me in the way I respond to somebody who is inside the church and somebody who claims to be a Christian and somebody who is not a Christian. To somebody who is not a Christian, my primary response is that of Jesus. Is the person who is in a homosexual community that is experiencing same-sex sexual relations, is that a sin? Yes. But I want you to notice here that there were a whole list of sins that were listed. Notice in here that we also have gossips that are listed. Notice in here that we even have disobedience to parents. I'm sure that doesn't apply to anybody in here. We also have the arrogant. I think there have been times as we've gone through the homosexual issue that the church has been quite arrogant. Which, by the way, that's a sin. Proud, boastful, I like this one, inventors of evil, as if there isn't enough evil, we're going to find new ways to do it. I know some of you guys are guilty of that one. Um, but there's a whole list of sins that are here. And these don't all go back saying the people who are involved in same-sex attraction are guilty of these. It's going back to saying those people that do not worship God, that do not recognize God, that do not follow the Creator God, they are guilty of these things. And you know, for me, I don't care what the sin is that they're involved in. I don't care how horrendous it is. I have a Jesus who wants to save them, that wants to purify them, that wants to forgive them of their sins. Regardless of how that is. So for me, my message to the world, to those outside the church, is Jesus and Jesus loves you and Jesus wants to forgive you and Jesus wants a relationship with you. But now if you're inside the church, and as you go through our membership process, we're pretty clear on this, at least I try to be. If you're inside the church, if you're a Christian, you're making a statement that I am a Christ follower, and we are going to hold you accountable to what you say you are, and to what you say you want to do. If you're inside the church, we are not going to sit idly by and allow you to live in sin regardless of what that sin is. And if you want to be a member of our church, you have to be willing to make a decision that you are going to make serious effort to live a life that is honoring and glorifying to God. There have been people over the years that I wish would become members of Sunrise Church. But they were not able to become members of Sunrise Church because they were choosing to live in sin, unrepented sin, just not homosexuality, but other sins. And me, along with the deacons, have had to make the decision, the, this person we cannot allow to be a member of a church because members of our church are people that are sinners who are repenting of their sin or trying to live a life that glorifies God and if they're not willing to take basic steps to do that then we're not going to be able to let them be members of our church even though we desperately want them to be members of our church and it isn't just homosexuality that happens with that is a numerous different sins that we've struggled with that, with the church, people we wanted to become members, but they weren't able to because of unrepentant sin in their life. The truth is that homosexuality, same-sex attraction, and same-sex sexual relations, it is a sin. Don't hear me say anything else this morning. That, that, that's a sin. But I also want you to hear this. One of the greatest sins that I see within the church, one of the greatest sins I see within our community, almost all goes back to sexual immorality. We have a culture that is sexually depraved. I'm reading too many studies that give out numbers of members of the church and of leadership within the church that are involved in, sex, in, in pornography 
That's sexual immorality. Too many studies have come out and are looking at the number of people that are living together and not married. That's sexual immorality. Too many times we have people in our church that are having sex with somebody outside of marriage. That's sexual morality. I think that's one of the greatest since facing just not homosexuality, but across the board and as a church. I think that we've decided to take one sin that many of us don't struggle with inside the church, and we've decided to make that a scapegoat, and we will continue to focus on them while we ignore our own sins. But the truth is, as a church, we are struggling with much sexual immorality within our own churches and within our Christian community, but yet we feel like we've deserved the right to call out the sin in other people whenever we need to be doing a better job of calling out the sin that exists within our church bodies. But the last two things that it mentions of the people that are not following God is that they are unloving and unmerciful. As a church, we need to be in the wholesale business. I like Costco because it's a wholesaler. When you go to Costco, you just don't pick up a can of beans, you pick up a can of beans. You just don't get a hot dog, you get hot dogs. If you go and you try to get a hot dog from the little cafe, it just isn't a hot dog, it's a hot dog. And church, whenever it comes to things like love and mercy and grace... We need to be in the wholesale business. We're not stingy. If you come here looking for love, if you come here looking for mercy, if you come here looking for grace, we're not going to give you a sampling. We're going to give you so much, you're going to wonder if you're ever going to be able to use it all. And whenever people come to our church, that's, that's who we need to be as a Christian community, and I'm afraid we haven't been that to the homosexual community. I will give you one name this morning of somebody who's a very dear person to me. Her name is Donna. Donna's no longer with us, and in fact, I am very concerned that she's going to be spending eternity in hell. She died about two years ago. She's somebody that had been involved in my life for most of my life. Donna was a lesbian, Donna grew up Catholic. One time whenever I was younger, I don't even remember the context in which the conversation came up. I said something about, do you go to church? Do you love Jesus? And she looked at me and she laughed. And she said, for a long time, I tried to do the Hail Marys. I tried to do all the things the church told me to do in order to make up for my sins. And she told me, I've sinned so much Jesus can't forgive me anymore. This was a woman that I knew from before the time I was a Christian. That saw me come to Christ and she remained my friend and a friend of my family. This is a woman that knew me whenever I felt called to go into ministry. She didn't abandon me, but she felt abandoned by the church. Whenever I first went to my first church start, she sent me a note and, a, and money to help me start my first church. Deb and I were talking about it, and she goes, I know that name because I think I've invited her to our weddings and stuff. And I said, yeah. And whenever I've prepared for this sermon, the name that keeps coming to mind, the face that keeps coming to mind is that of Donna. And Donna felt like what she had done, the lifestyle that she had lived, that she was unable to experience forgiveness from Jesus. Jesus. 
But you know, whenever Donna got to, whenever she passed, the questions that God asked, he didn't say, Donna, are you straight or are you a lesbian? There was one question. Do you know my son? Because whenever that time comes that we find ourselves before the judge, he's not going to say, oh, you're straight, don't worry, we're going to let you in. He's not going to say you're a lesbian, you're gay, transsexual, transgender, oh, we got a special place in hell for you. The question that he's going to ask is, do you know my son? And for Donna, she had been taught over the years that her salvation was based upon her actions. Our salvation, for us, the salvation of the world, is not based upon how good we can do And how much bad we do, it's based upon a relationship. And the relationship it's based upon is Jesus. And when if somebody comes up to you, regardless of their sin, regardless of their lifestyle, and they say, do you think I can get to heaven? We don't list their sins. We don't ask them to list their sins. We say, I have one question for you. What is your relationship with Jesus? If you have a relationship with Jesus, you're going to heaven. If you don't, you are going to hell. And it doesn't matter the lifestyle you're in, it doesn't matter the sin that you're in, it doesn't matter the communities you're a part of, it doesn't matter what you've done, it comes down to Jesus and church, we have failed at that message. I am tired of seeing people holding up signs on the street corner, listing out sins and say, going to hell. I'm tired of it. Our response needs to be simple. Relationship with Jesus, you go to heaven don't have a relationship with Jesus, you go to hell. And everything else in the whole scheme of things will become inconsequential. But now remember, the biggest decision, the biggest thing I'm supposed to do is to baptize those people who are deciding to follow Jesus, have a relationship with Jesus. Now there's also a discipleship part with that. And with people that have same-sex attractions, it's not easy. And in fact, I have a great deal of sympathy for them whenever they decide to join the church. Because for, for many of them, there isn't a simple, easy, right answer. But it's going to be hard. But you know it's hard for any of us whenever we come to Jesus and we are sinners. And we desire to be in the likeness of Christ. There's a lot of things in our lives that are going to change. That's true for the person that has same-sex attraction as it is for the person that has an alcohol problem, that has a gambling problem, for the person that has a gasping problem, that has an arrogance problem, that's narcissistic. For all of us, it's going to take a lot of change. But to those people that are outside the church who are not followers of Jesus, we have one primary message. Jesus loves you. And if our message is anything but that, we better be careful. Because whenever people look at the church, we've gotten a reputation of being hate. Whether we did or not, that's the reputation we have. But we need to be, have the reputation of love, of mercy, of grace. Let's pray. God, I come to you this morning... Guilty. Guilty of being arrogant. Guilty of being unloving. Guilty of being unmerciful. Guilty of gossip. Guilty of slander. And God, I pray... That we as a church would be known for our love. And Jesus, do not let us get our messages mixed up. Let us realize that we're not the judge. We're not here to condemn. 
But God, let us be a church that in every moment, at every time, in every conversation, we're pointing people to you. And God, I pray there wouldn't be another one like Donna that feels like the message she received from the church is you've sinned so much. You can't be saved. But God, let our message be regardless of who you are, regardless of the sins you've committed, you can be saved. And we're the living proof of that. Because we were saved from our sins. And God, I pray for those people that struggle with same-sex attraction and are in the church. Lord, I pray that we would be merciful to them, but we'd realize that, that you are God and that we'd allow the Holy Spirit to work in their life and the decisions that they'll have to make and the struggles they'll have to face. But God, I pray for all of us in here. That we would realize at the end of the day what matters isn't our title, isn't the sins that we've committed, but at the end of the day, the question that'll be asked is, do you know my son? And God, I pray that everybody here would be able to say yes. And God, I pray because of the people that are in this room, there will be thousands more that will be able to say yes. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.